Tonight we continue on our series, Spiritual versus Physical Shipwrecks. Tonight we have part three. You recall that last week was Missions Sunday. We had the DVD, Dr. David Livingston, Missionary Explorer. And tonight is Spiritual versus Physical Shipwrecks. <clears throat> and next Sunday, even if I don't finish tonight, next week is Reformation Sunday. Wonderful, wonderful, exciting time of the year when we celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ and the wonderful gift of God's Word. And so we're going to be having a DVD called Mightier Than the Sword. Indeed, that's the Word of God. That was what was given back to us in the Protestant Reformation. We hope you can be here for that. And that is next Sunday evening. <coughs> Excuse me. But tonight, spiritual versus physical shipwrecks. We're in Acts chapter 27. I'm going to start reading at verse 21 if you'd like to follow along. I hope you do. Acts chapter 27. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. But now, I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wouldn't you like to be sailing with Paul? Well, perhaps you would still be scared in the storm. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Albeit, we must be cast upon a certain island. No accidents in the plan of God. For on the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country and sounded, and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again, and found it fifteen fathoms. And then, fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea under colors as though they would have cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Except these abide in the ship, ye cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the rope to the boat and let her fall off. While the day was coming on, Paul besought them all to take meat, saying, This day is the fourteenth day that you've tarried and continued fasting, having taken nothing. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. For there shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks in the presence of them all. And when he had broken it, he began to eat. Then were they all of good cheer, and they also took some meat. And we were in all in the ship two hundred, threescore, and sixteen souls. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word, for its excitement, for its power for the clear hand of the sovereign God at work in human history in specific ways, in specific lives, in specific occasions and occurrences, and you are God. As Paul said, for I believe God. Father, we pray that you'll take your word tonight, that you'll encourage our hearts, that you'll challenge us to further obedience regardless of the storms of life, that whether we run through a physical shipwreck or not, we will not make spiritual shipwreck of that which you have entrusted to us, for we carry the precious cargo of the gospel of Christ. Father, we pray for your blessings on your word as it goes forth tonight. We pray that it would not return unto you void, but that it would indeed accomplish that which you please, and that it would indeed prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. A summary of what we've done so far, the physical versus spiritual shipwreck. So far we have tied predestination, election, and the sovereignty of God 
to the predestined storms of life. Nothing happens by accident. There are no accidents in the plan of God. There are only incidents. No accidents, only incidents. We began by looking at the elect. We saw that the term was used in seven different ways in scripture. In each case, it referred to God making a choice, God choosing an individual or a group for a specific preordained purpose. First, the term elect was used of Christ. Second, the term elect was used of the holy angels in contrast to the fallen angels, that is the demons. Third, the term elect was used of Israel in the Old Testament. Fourth, the term elect was used of Israel during the Great Tribulation. And in light of our current events, I think probably the next book we'll study is the book of Revelation. Fifth, the term elect is used of God's children in every dispensation who call on him. Sixth, the term elect is used of believers in the church age. Seventh, the term elect is used to describe local churches composed of true believers. Then we looked at all the occurrences of the word election and saw that it falls into four categories. The first category, the term election is used in the New Testament of national Israel in contrast to the church. The second category, the term election is used in the New Testament to distinguish believing Jews from non-believing Jews. That is, a distinction between national Israel as a group contrasted with specifically chosen Jews whom God has chosen for salvation. The third category, the ter term election is used of individual believers in the church age. Fourth category, we saw that there are three essential character qualities to election. The three character qualities are the three elements are, the first element, election is not based on works. Second element, election is based on grace. Third element, election does not negate human responsibility. Then we began to study election in relation to predestination and made practical application of these two great doctrines to the storms that we personally face in our lives. In the case in our text tonight, God predestined that 276 people would live through perhaps one of the greatest storms in all of earth history and be cast on a certain island to accomplish a specific evangelistic purpose ordained by God. <clears throat> they hadn't planned to stop there <clears throat> on their journey to Rome, but God said you're going to stop there anyway because I have some elect on that island and I want to make sure that they hear the gospel. You're going to lose your boat. You're going to lose your cargo. You're going to lose everything that you own, but you're going to keep your lives so that you'll know that I'm a sovereign God in heaven and so that certain people who need to hear the gospel will hear it and you'll hear it too and some of you on this ship are going to get saved and it's going to change the life of a captain of a ship it's going to change the life of sailors of a ship it's going to change the life of a centurion and of soldiers and it's going to give an encouragement to all the believers who are traveling with Paul all 276 of you are going to live that's incredible and that kind of a storm with people who don't know how to swim and a ship that's broken apart as it's cast on the rocks and they all make it safely to land. The carnal mind hates predestination because predestination means that God predetermines our ultimate final destination and the destination of all morally accountable creatures, the angels in advance. He predetermines those outcomes solely with two things in mind. Number one, his glory. Number two, the ultimate best of his elect in mind. Predestination is an expression of the sovereign will of God, not the will of man. And then I broke it down for you so it would make it easy to understand. We saw that predestination is expressed in at least ten categories. The first three of those relate to salvation. So that we are fully aware that salvation is the work of God, not the work of man. But there are ten categories of predestination. Category one, salvation part one, being made children of God by adoption. We're full heirs of Christ by legal adoption. We're personally recognized by the Father as sons and therefore rightful heirs. Category number two, part two of salvation, being made children of God through sanctification. God sets us apart in such a way that we will not die before the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit takes place at the moment that God causes us to have faith. Dead men do not choose to have faith by themselves. Faith is a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 make that very clear. If you have regenerating life come into your life, if you have regenerating believing faith come into your life, it's because God gave it to you, not because you worked it up. Not because in the flesh you decided to trust in Jesus. God alone has the right to bring the dead to life. Then category three related to salvation. 
Part three, being made children of God by faith. So you're made children of God by adoption, children of God through sanctification, children of God through faith, that is through the new birth. God gives faith to the elect as his sovereign gift. Category four, we are predestined to an eternal inheritance. And that brings us to the predestination and things that come that God graciously adds to our secure salvation. Category five, predestined to have and exercise specific spiritual gifts. We saw predestination in relation to the gifts that each one of us give or get. God is the one who gives the gifts. You don't choose your gifts. You don't say, I like this gift better than that gift over there. It's just like at Christmas time, if you give gifts to other people, they don't get to choose their gift. You buy the gift and it's a surprise. When they open it up, they say, ooh. Now, of course, we always drop hints, don't we? How many of you have ever dropped a hint related to a Christmas present? Oh, okay. At least a few of you are honest. Okay. <laughs> when you were a kid, do you remember? Oh, man, I hope I get that bicycle. You know? And um, maybe you got it, maybe you didn't. But when it comes to spiritual gifts, God looks down and he is ordering his church on earth in such a way that he makes sure that every local church has the full complement of gifts that is necessary for that church not only to survive, but for that church to excel and to grow. Even in this small group, there is a complement that is complete, not complement with an I, with an E, complete all that is necessary for this church to grow and to minister one to another. You say, wow, I, I don't see it. Well, that's perhaps because somebody is hiding his or her gift or gifts. We all have multiple gifts. We went through a long series on that. We'll not cover it again tonight. That was category five. Category six, predestined for a special offering up to God. And you remember we talked about that was the sacrifice of first fruits we covered it briefly the last time we were together. First, we saw that it's the result of a sovereign predestinating will of God. And that's a very important doctrine in relation to the resurrection. I talked about that in passing as we did Marilyn Fawcett's funeral this past week. It is very important to resurrection. So last time we analyzed the New Testament doctrine of first fruits. The New Testament reference to first fruits falls into five divisions. I hope you got them at that time, because I'm going to just cover them briefly here. First, first fruits is used to speak of the first budding of new spiritual life in the believer that makes him or her yearn for the transformation of the body at the resurrection of the rapture. That's how it ties into the resurrection. Second, that's why it, Christ is called the first fruits of them that slept, because it's tied to resurrection. Third, first fruits is used of every believer in a particular region who comes to Christ and what joy that brings to the evangelist or missionary or pastor since it means that a greater harvest will be coming. First fruits is the guarantee of a harvest. First fruits is the guarantee of a harvest. We saw that it was used in the same region, both of an individual who was a first fruits of an, an entire family who was a first fruits in the region of Achaia. Fourth, first fruits is also used of the Heavenly Father imparting the divine seed of faith in the believer who bursts out with new life. Fifth, we saw that it's also used of those who are morally pure in the book of Revelation, those who have burst forth with new life that has not been defiled, Revelation 14.4. That brought us to category number seven. <clears throat> that finished the category of first fruits, brings us to the seventh category of predestination. We are predestined to bear spiritual fruit. We are first fruits, but we are also predestined to bear spiritual fruits. Spiritual fruits and spiritual gifts are not the same thing. Both are predestined, but spiritual gifts are different from spiritual fruit. Because spiritual fruit, not spiritual gifts, spiritual fruit is the visible proof of predestination and election. Without the bearing of fruit, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit, and divinely ordained good works, Ephesians 2.10, Category 8 below, which we'll look at in a second, there is no assurance that an individual is among the elect. If you do not have fruit, you are not among the elect. Because the elect all have predestined fruit. Category 8. The eighth category of predestination is predestined to manifest specific good works to the glory of God. Works and fruit are not the same thing. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So spiritual gifts, spiritual fruit, spiritual works. Those are different and distinct, and many people confuse those different categories. 
Works must meet a threefold test required by God. One, done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Two, in obedience to the word of God. Three, to the glory of God. That brings up, brought us to category number nine. Predestination is part of the eternal counsels of God concerning the future work of Christ. Christ himself taught this. We saw it in John chapter 5, verses 20 through 29. Paul repeated it in his sermon in Acts 10, 42, that Jesus Christ will be the judge. Category 10. And this is the one everybody really, really hates. Reprobation is also predestined as perhaps the most hated part of the doctrine of predestination. Some have phrased it more gently that God just passed over the non-elect, but the result is clearly the same. <clears throat> However, reprobation is stated specifically in Jude 1.4. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. That's reprobation. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So with those things in mind, we can be confident that the storms in our life are designed by God to cause us to reach a specific destination that he has preordained and preplanned for us. And God always reaches his goal. He made sure that ship got exactly to the island that he wanted it to get to, not to some other island, not to have people floating around and going to different islands. He got them all to the same island so that they would know for sure that his word was true, that his promise that all 276 of them would make it out alive. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So Paul looked at his multiple shipwrecks with confidence. Can you look at the shipwrecks, all the horrible things that have happened in your life? He looked with confidence that these things were designed by God to make him into the man that God wanted him to be. Think about all the bad things that have ever happened in your life. Even things that you look back on with shame. Did you know that God was knocking out some parts of your life that he didn't want to be there? Can you look back at that? You're morally accountable. You are responsible before God. But God uses, well, like David says in the Psalms, even the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. In other words, it will never get to the point where it doesn't ultimately, in some manner, bring praise and glory to God. The multiple shipwrecks gave Paul confidence that these things were designed by God to make him into the man that God wanted him to be. So a question for you. Do you feel emotional pain? Do you feel mental pain? Do you feel physical pain? Do you feel spiritual pain because of some trial that you are facing in your life? predestination is a doctrine of comfort. It's not a doctrine of the nasty God. It's a doctrine of comfort. That is, if you have Paul's outlook on predestination. <clears throat> we read just in passing 2 Corinthians 11, 25, two weeks ago. I'm going to spend some time in 2 Corinthians 11 tonight, the Lord willing. But remember what it said, Thrice was I beaten with rods. How many of you here have ever really been beaten with a rod? I was actually thinking if I could have found one, something like the canes that they use over in Singapore. And they wail the daylights out of people with those things. For small infractions. They'll tie you down. They'll stretch your hands out, tie them down, tie your feet down, and then some big, strong, husky, ugly guy goes, kawam, 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 kawam. Three times Paul went through that. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. We've studied that already in the book of Acts. Doesn't mean he was on drugs. <laughs> Doesn't mean he was drunk. They took stones and tried to kill him. I think they did. I think that's what he's talking about when he says, I knew a man, you know, and uh, he saw things going on in the third heaven, but wow, I can't tell you about all those things. Man, it's unbelievable. 
Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. We've only seen one of them here in the book of Acts. But did you know there were two other times that Paul got shipwrecked? I think I would stay away from boats after the first one. Thrice was I shipwrecked. At night and the day I've been in the deep. That wasn't this shipwreck, it was a different shipwreck. He was out there for at least 36 hours. You know, that's in contrast to the kind of suffering we have, isn't it? It's in the context of an immense amount of suffering in Paul's ministry. And yet Paul kept on going because he believed it was predestined for his good and for the glory of God. That God would never allow anything into his life that not, did not fit perfectly into the divine plan. You have that kind of confidence in the predestinating sovereign hand of God? That God will never let anything into your life that does not perfectly fit his divine plan? You see, embracing the biblical doctrine of predestination gives you perfect confidence and perfect peace as you sail boldly into the horrifying and sometime extended storms of life. You know, not all the storms in your life are going to be 30-minute squalls. Not all the storms in your life are merely physical inconveniences. Some of the storms of life involve direct confrontation with Satan, with the demons, with vicious apostates, with violent governments, and intense suffering. And yet Paul talks about how he glories in these things. Paul gloried in all of this. He gloried in sailing into the, the very teeth of the worst storms. You know why? Because it gave him confidence that he was squarely in the center of the will of God. Sort of like the old saying, <laughs> with all this opposition from the wicked, I must be doing something right. Let me give you the context of that verse about his three times suffering shipwreck. It comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's an extended passage, so if you want to follow along, I'm going to start reading in verse 10. 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Now remember, he had two different first fruits in Achaia. He had an individual, Epinetus, and he had a whole family, the household of Siphanus, who were called the first fruits of Achaia. And the Apostle Paul says, I want to let you know what it's like. In fact, I'm not just going to sit here and whine and moan and groan about all the bad things that happened to me. I'm going to boast about them. I'm going to tell you how exciting it is to sail into the teeth of the storm. <laughs> you have things that you can look back on in your life and say, man, that was a tough storm. I'm going to give God glory for it, but you know what? I'm going to tell other people about how God brought me through that storm. How he spared my life. You've heard my story about how God spared my life driving to Alabama with a an 8,000 pound van and a 5,200 pound car and a 400 pound dolly and how I was going through rain and storms and passing different people who'd wrecked on the side of the road several times on that way down there totally exhausted and I got to my mechanic where I was going to drop off that car and I said my brakes are kind of funny last couple hundred miles it's been sort of mushy would you check them out and we detached the car and we detached the dolly. And his mechanic got in and drove it into the shop, maybe 50 feet, and lightly, and only driving four or five miles an hour, and lightly touched the brakes while he was right over the lift. And it broke. One more time of hitting the brakes, and I would have been dead. Does that give me something to praise God about? You're not kidding, it does. Here's Paul. 
As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. Paul didn't say, I'm going to soft pedal it because it'll, it'll scare you. I don't, want, I don't want you to hear about this too much because then you will not want a witness. Then you will want to be a wishy-washy, flabby Christian because you, gotta, you want to stay away from all that bad stuff happening in your life and you'll try to hide out somewhere. Paul says, no, I'm going to tell you about it. And I'm going to tell you about it because it's exciting. Because living on the edge is exciting. Because living to the glory of God is exciting. Because facing all the opposition is exciting. The exhilaration of battle. The exhilaration of sailing into the teeth of the storm. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. But what I do that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we are. He says, okay, let's look at it. These guys who are these false apostles, these guys who are the heretics, what have they suffered for Christ? Nothing. They're busy, as both Peter and Jude talk about, making merchandise of you. They don't give. They sell you. They get the money out of you if they can. They twist and grind and move so that you will feel like you've got to give money to them. What I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion. That wherein they glory, they may be found even as we are. Now listen to what he says about them. Here's where Paul starts sailing into the teeth of the storm. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Paul sailed into those storms. He didn't hesitate. He didn't back up. He didn't flinch. He didn't back down. He called the spade a spade. He confronted them. He wouldn't let them get away with their false teaching. And he said, let's see what you've suffered for Christ. Put it on the line, buddy. Let's see what you've suffered for Christ. That's where Paul starts his fight. Where he starts his battle with the storm. And then it goes on, verse 14, it intensifies and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Do you think Paul ever got opposition from the devil and the demons? Or did they just sort of go, oh, there's another one of those silly Christians. Don't worry about him. Something will happen to him. Or do you think they opposed him? Do you think that he constantly had to be wearing the spiritual armor of what he speaks in Ephesians chapter 6? Did he sail into the teeth of the storm even if the devil was there looking him in the eyeballs? Even if the demons were motivating people all around him to attack him? He didn't flinch. And those were people who were plan pretending to be good people. Those were people like at Jerusalem who were going to defend the temple of God from the heretic. And they went about to kill him. But God sent some Romans down to rescue him. You know, you might have somebody rescue you who you don't particularly like. Think about this upcoming election. Don't be so pious that you say, I wouldn't want that particular person to rescue me. Because after all, think of all the horrible things that he or she has done. Be careful. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. God keeps records. And God uses even Romans. Verse 16, I say again, let no man think me a fool. If otherwise, yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. You think I'm nuts? A lot of people would say, Paul, you're nuts. I mean, you could have avoided some of those confrontations. You could have bypassed some of those cities where you knew they didn't like the gospel. You could have gone someplace where they were really friendly and had a, had a rock band up on stage and strobe lights and everybody wiggling around and feeling good about themselves because they'd mixed Baal worship with Christianity. And that's what those churches are that mix all that rubbish 
into so-called praise and worship. That's Baal worship mixed with Christianity, and God hates it. That which I speak, I speak it not after the Lord, but as it were foolishly in the confidence of boasting. He's talking tongue-in-cheek. Seeing that many glory after the flesh, I'll glory also. You suffer fools gladly. <laughs> those guys who are talking in the flesh, those are fools. Okay, well, listen to me. I will glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. A little bit of sarcastic humor there. For ye suffer if a man bring you into bondage. They thought they were free. If a man devour you, they thought they were getting fed, but they were getting eaten. If a man take of you, they thought they were getting, but they were getting robbed. If a man exalt himself, they thought, oh, these wonderful ministers, which were ministers of light, like the devil. If a man smite you on the face, Oh, I'm learning humility. I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak. Howbeit, whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Okay, let's compare credentials, says Paul. And it's going to be credentials not just of who we are, but of what we've gone through. Are the Hebrews? So am I. Are the Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? Remember, he's been talking about it's no great thing if Satan's ministers be transformed as ministers of righteousness. That's the context. He's talking about guys who are phonies, who are doing things that are contrary to the word of God, who are eating the church instead of suffering for the church. Are the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Now listen, here's our list. These are the storms where Paul sailed directly into the teeth of the storm. In labors more abundant. If anybody worked hard, it was Paul. You know, it was wonderful to hear the testimony that was given concerning Marilyn Fawcett that Gary Johnson had sent in, and Brother Coleman read that testimony, about when Marilyn went to Mwingi in Africa, how she was given an African name. Everybody gets an African nickname who goes to Africa. All the white guys all get a nickname. And hers was Hard Worker. Hard Worker. Here's Paul talking about it. He said, in labor is more abundant in stripes above measure. Remember those beatings that he got? Those weren't counted out exactly right. The Jewish ones were, but not the pagan ones. The Jews could only give 40 stripes, and they always gave 39 just in case they had miscounted. And so Paul says, I lost count how many times I got beaten in stripes above measure. When was the last time you got beaten for your faith? Paul is boasting here. He's saying, I want to tell you what it's like, not to scare you, not because I don't love you, but I want to tell you when you're in the center of God's will and you're not running away and trying to hide so that you don't have to do what God called you to do and so that it will be easy on you. I'm telling you this because I love you, says Paul. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. I told you about a missionary letter that I read this morning just before I came to the morning worship service that I felt compelled to read. A pastor and his wife who have not gotten bitter, not gotten angry, but instead have become thankful for the many times they've been in prison and then released to continue the gospel and they haven't been killed yet. They're thankful that they haven't been killed yet. Why? So they can live longer? No! So that they can proclaim the gospel! In prisons, more frequent. In deaths, off. That's often. Paul, 
faced death every day, and he stared it down. How many times has your life been at risk because you preached the gospel? Because you refused to compromise? Because you bore testimony for Jesus and they threatened to kill you and you said, I will not deny my Lord. Paul says, he can't even count it. It's been so often I don't remember the number. And deaths often of the Jews, five times received thy forty stripes, save one. Remember those first beatings? Those were above measure. That was from the pagans. But five different times. Figure that out. Five times forty. That's two hundred minus five. A hundred and ninety-five times he got hit in a judicial context by the Jews. Would you have been willing to go through that more than once? Paul believed in the predestinating purposes of God. Paul rejoiced in the predestinating purposes of God. Paul rejoiced in the storms of life that he had to face because it showed him that he was directly in the center of God's will because the opposition was so fierce against the gospel. Folks, that's powerful. And we think we suffer a little bit. Of the Jews five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. We talked about that verse. In journeyings often. You know, it's so funny when I read that one. We think we have trouble when we get a flat tire on vacation. <laughs> Almost every other step Paul took was a flat tire. And he walked. How would you like to go those thousands of miles? I once read that John Wesley, he's an Arminian, but <laughs> he certainly preached the gospel, rode nearly a million miles on horseback. Do you think you might be a little saddle sore? in journeyings often, in perils of waters. I know a lot of people who won't even get on a boat because they're so scared of the water. In perils of robbers. Now some of you here have experienced pickpockets. Some of you have may have had your houses robbed. I've had my house down in Alabama broken into four or five times. People have stolen stuff. But I wasn't in any peril. The robbers weren't coming after me. They were just getting material junk of earth. When was the last time somebody held you up at gunpoint? Because you were in a place where you knew God wanted you to preach the gospel. You would not have been there any other reason except God called you to call, preach the gospel, to share Christ with somebody. You'd gone down to visit somebody that you'd met and, and it was a really dangerous area of the city. And somebody came at you with a knife. Said, give me everything you've got. In perils of robbers. In perils by mine own countrymen. This wasn't a bunch of Gentiles. Paul says, you know, it was the Jews, first of all, that were after my skin. Do you remember how a group of more than 40 of them bound themselves with an oath that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul? When was the last time that happened to you? Paul sailed into the teeth of the storm because he knew that's where God had called him to go. In perils in the city. Uh, excuse me, I skipped one. In perils by the heathen. Jews, Gentiles. In perils in the city. Say, well, let's stay out of the city. 
Okay, we're going to go hide out someplace in Alaska. Okay, in perils in the wilderness. You can't get away from it. In perils in the sea. And that's even different than the perils in the water. So apparently there were some rivers or some lakes someplace that Paul's life was in danger. In perils among false brethren. Remember, he started with those, the false apostles, the deceitful workers who transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ. People who faked being Christians and then betrayed Paul. Have you ever been around somebody who pretended to be a Christian, but you knew that behind your back they were stabbing you? I have. Nothing like Paul, though. In weariness and painfulness. How many times, for the sake of the gospel, have you been so exhausted you could hardly stand up? How many times, for the sake of the gospel, have you pressed your body to the limit so that you were actually experiencing physical pain because you were pressing yourself to the limit? Do you see how many things there are here? These are storms in life. In watchings, often. Paul stayed up nights because of his concern for those who were lost. In hunger and thirst, most of us can't go more than four hours without having to have something to stuff into our faces. And we complain about it. I gotta have something to eat, gotta have something to eat, gotta have something. Paul says, look, over and over, I was in hunger and thirst in fastings often. The first ones he couldn't control, the second ones he could. The fastings. What was he doing it for? He told you at the beginning, do you remember? It was because he was preaching the gospel. In cold and nakedness. I know what it's like to be cold and not to have quite enough clothes to cover yourself. I remember I'd been at a rescue mission down in Boston when I was in college. And after all that we'd been doing down there, I came home on the train. And I fell asleep on the train. And it was the dead of winter, way below zero. Lots of snow on the ground. And the train came to its end, way past my station. And the doctor said, well, you're gonna have to get off. I said, well, can't drive, at least ride back to where I was supposed to get off? No, no, you gotta get off. And it was the dead of winter. And I only had a light jacket on. It was actually a, a sports coat because we'd been preaching down at the mission. You know, I didn't have a sweater or anything else. It was stupid of me, but that's <laughs> typical. And I started to walk. In the general direction, I wasn't even quite sure which roads to take to get back to the college. I was cold. I can identify with Paul here. But it happened to him over and over and over again. And finally, there was a little restaurant beside the road that was open. And I went in just shivering cold. And the owner of the restaurant said, well, you can make a phone call to the college. And at least I had the number of the dormitory. And one of my friends picked up the phone and he had a car. And he knew where this place was. And he picked me up. I would have probably frozen to death if I'd had to walk all the rest of the way back to the college. In cold and nakedness. Are you willing to be deprived of any of the physical comforts of life for the sake of the gospel? And Paul chose to sail into the teeth of the storms of life because he knew what God had called him to do. And it didn't matter what the opposition was. It didn't matter what the cost was. It didn't matter what the sufferings were. It didn't matter whether or not the world, the flesh, the devil, and the demons were opposed to him. He knew if God called him to do it, he would make it through.
because God is a predestinating sovereign God and never lets us face things that we cannot handle, that he himself will not provide for us during those trials of life. That's a comforting doctrine, folks. That's what enabled Paul to go through all this stuff we've just read. <laughs> but you know what he said? You know, that's Mickey Mouse problems. He says, you know what my real problem was? He tells you in the next verse. All those other things that we just talked about, that's really, really not very much. Beside those things which are without, all that other stuff was outside problems. That which cometh upon me daily, his biggest storm, his daily storm, all those other things happened every now and then. You know, oh, well, I got beaten five times. <laughs> of you know, the Jews, I, I got beaten, you know, 235 times. Um, but it didn't happen every day. And I was glad when those things were over. But you know what I had every day? That which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. That was the biggest, most discouraging storm in Paul's life. Taking care of believers who really didn't care. Who really weren't willing to put their shoulder to the plow. Who really weren't willing to suffer for Jesus. Who really weren't willing to be divested of any of their material things for the sake of the gospel. The care of all the churches. Who is weak? And I'm not weak. Remember, he's comparing himself to the false apostles, the deceitful workers who transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ. He says, okay, come on, guys. Pony up, let's hear it. Who's weak? And I'm not weak. Who's offended? And I burn not. Where have you been offended for the gospel's sake and stood up and been willing to take this kind of stuff for the sake of Jesus? If I must needs glory, remember he started about talking about how he's boasting. He says, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to boast about. I'm not going to boast about my accomplishments. I'm not going to boast about all this stuff that I learned from Gamaliel. I'm not going to boast about all this stuff, how I was on the Sanhedrin. We find that out in texts in different parts about these things, but that's not where Paul focused. If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. My weaknesses. I want to tell you how weak I am and how strong God is. I want to tell you how these horrible battles happened and I couldn't handle it, but God can handle it. I believe God. That's what Paul said on the boat. That's powerful. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Paul wasn't making this up. So like Rush Limbaugh says, I want to tell you something and I'm not making it up. <laughs> and then he tells you about some kind of horrible thing the liberals are doing. Paul says, I'm telling you the truth when I tell you the horrible things that happened to me. But I'm going to give God glory because I'm boasting about my weaknesses. I'm telling you how I couldn't handle it, but God handled it for me. In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king kept the city of the Damascenes with a garrison desirous to apprehend me. Paul said, I was stuck inside the city. The walls were around me. The gates were closed. There was an entire group of local policemen banging on every door trying to find me because they wanted to get me. And he says, and through a window in a basket was I let down and escaped his hands. You know, God used some wisdom in Paul also to get out of situations that Paul didn't need to be in. We have one of those here. That brings us to tonight, the most dangerous kind of shipwreck. Spiritual shipwreck is a completely different matter that does not have the benefits of the predestined storms of life that we've just been looking at. Can you believe it is 815?
But at least I got through that whole first part. Gave you a lot of new stuff tonight. But tonight I want to talk about, or I want to do, we'll have to do this next week. Not next week, the week following, because next week is Reformation Sunday. But I'll at least read the verse for you. Listen to what Paul says as he describes spiritual shipwreck. This is 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. And we're going to talk about the seven different categories of spiritual shipwreck when we get to it, the Lord willing. There are seven categories of spiritual shipwreck, but this is what Paul says. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck. You see, when you fail to handle the predestined storms of life in God's way, then you fall into temptation where you will make spiritual shipwreck of your life. We talked about some of the physical shipwrecks. We talked about some of the physical pressures. We talked about some of the things that we can't stand. If you don't handle it right, you will make spiritual shipwreck. There are seven different kinds of spiritual shipwreck listed in the New Testament. If you fail to handle the predestined storms of life the way God wants you to handle them, you will be tempted to the rocks of spiritual shipwreck. There are seven kinds of spiritual shipwreck that a man may have by responding to the storms of life in the flesh and not in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord willing, we'll pick that up in two weeks. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for the things that you've taught us tonight. We thank you for the courage of Paul, the boldness of Paul, because he understood predestination, because he understood election, because he understood the purposes and plan of God. And though he didn't always know exactly what it was, he knew that as he focused on your plan, he would sail directly into the teeth of the storm because Satan, the world, the flesh, and the demons do not want us to be in the center of your will. They do not want us to accomplish for the glory of God the testimony of Jesus Christ to those around us. They want us instead to whimper and whine and fuss and compromise and back down and avoid all the different kinds of pains that might come to life. And Paul went through all of it because he was focused on Jesus. And he knew that God would never allow anything into his life that was not for his good and for the glory of God. God would never allow anything to his life that God would not also provide the resources to handle. And that when it came time to go home to heaven, he would be able to say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give unto me, and not unto me only, but also unto all them that love his appearing. Help us to understand what an encouraging, comforting, strengthening doctrine predestination is and election and the purposes of a sovereign God in the lives of those who are his own. That we might rejoice regardless of what happens, even in this coming election, that we might rejoice that you are at work in our lives to conform us to the image of Christ. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, in line with what we have just studied tonight, let's sing number 728.